We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us virtually this morning for what we hope will be an informative presentation for tenants in the city of Richmond. My name is Paige Rusa, and I'm the Rent Program's Deputy Director, and Staff Attorney Palomar Sanchez will be conducting this morning's presentation. Before we get started, I just want to share a couple logistical things. Um, please note that this presentation has been posted on the website at mm -hmm. richmondrent.org slash workshops for your reference. And please also note that this presentation is being recorded and we hope that the uh, recording will be posted on our workshop page as well. If you have questions on a particular topic discussed today, we ask that you type your questions into the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen and we will address questions at the end. So without further ado, I would now like to introduce Palomar Sanchez. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, Paige, can we get the full screen view? There we go. All right. So this morning is the Rights and Responsibilities for Richmond Tenants. Uh, my name, as Paige said, is Palomar Sanchez. I'm one of the staff attorneys of the Richmond Rent Program. I'm also the Public Information Unit uh, Supervisor. Uh, we can go ahead and get to the next slide, please. All right, the first thing I wanted to give and provide is a community update. Um, clearly during this uh, pandemic, there's been a lot of um, orders and rule changes and things like that. So I just wanna discuss those really quick. Um, the Director of Emergency Services for Richmond issued an order, Resolution 2020, effective March 17, 2020, during the period of a local emergency in response to COVID-19. On April 27, 2020, the Richmond City Council passed a supplemental order Resolution 3420, and again on May 29, 2020, um, Resolution 4620, which states that no landlord may terminate a residential or commercial tenancy for non-payment of rent. And there's a asterisk there because um, if you see at the bottom, um, it says that the tenant must notify the landlord in writing of their inability to pay rent due to financial hardship related to COVID-19 and is responsible for paying any unpaid rent within 12 months after the order is lifted. Um, they also cannot um, terminate a residential or commercial tenancy for any no fault, just cause eviction, such as an owner move in, withdrawal from the rental market, otherwise known as an Ellis Act eviction, or substantial repairs or a temporary tenancy. Go ahead, next slide, please. Um, so, as you saw, there were previous iterations and um, of this order. And uh, as the pandemic goes on, it's been getting extended. Um, so the last iteration was extended to July 15th, 2020. And it may be further extended depending on the pandemic. Um, the order also prohibits any residential rent increases for any rent controlled properties through July 15th. Um, exceptions to the rent increase prohibition. So there are properties that can still rec receive uh, rent increase rent increases. Um, and so those exceptions include properties such as single family homes, condominiums, new newly construction. So anything that was built after February of 1995, and any other property whose rent cannot be regulated pursuant to state or federal law. Um, Landlords may also not charge any late fees right now, um, and uh, they cannot require any documentation to provide financial hardship. Um, the first iteration of the order actually did say documentation um, had to be provided, but then they changed that. So no longer can a landlord require documentation. All that is required is the notice. Um, for the most up-to-date information, you can see our website at www.richmondrent.org, and that um, also has a template letter for any tenant who wishes to, um, you know, seek some assistance in informing their landlord, they can use our template as a basis. Next slide, please. All right, today we're going over some of these topics. These are the major topics that I'm going to be discussing today. So purpose of the rent ordinance is first. Uh, overview of the rich and rent ordinance. We're going to discuss some properties covered under the ordinance. Um, we're gonna discuss just cause for evictions, uh, eviction noticing requirements and the process a little bit. Uh, we'll be discussing maximum allowable rent, base rent, the annual general adjustment, otherwise known as the AGA, and rent increase noticing requirement. 
um, when rents can be raised to market, uh, rent adjustment petitions, and overview of important California civil codes. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. All right. So the purpose of the rent ordinance. Uh, the purpose of the Richmond Fair Rent Just Cause for Eviction and Homeowner Protection Ordinance, also known as the Rent Ordinance, is to promote neighborhood and community stability, healthy housing, and affordability for renters in the city of Richmond by controlling excessive rent increases and arbitrary evictions to the greatest extent allowable under California law, while also ensuring landlords a fair return. Next slide, please. So this is a brief kind of overview of the ordinance in terms of um, its inception. So um, on November 8th, 2016, the rent ordinance passed uh, by the Richmond voters. On December 30th, 2016, the rent ordinance went into effect. That was the first date. And then on January 3rd, 2017, the program office opened, the physical office opened up. Um, so uh, on the right, it says that rent increases, so what this, ordinance did is it says it created this new type of program, right, where it's we started to regulate rent. So rent increases are limited now to the annual general adjustment, which is 100% of CPI, which is that stands for the consumer price index of the Bay Area. Um, base rents are had to be rolled back to the rent paid by the tenant on July 21st, 2015 or the first rent paid by the tenant for tenancy for any tenancy commencing after July 21st, 2015. So again, if your tenancy was in existence prior to that July 2015 date, um, then then that is, it gets, you have to look at what you were paying on July 21st, 2015 to determine the base rent. However, if you moved in after that date, then whatever your initial rent was, that becomes your base rent. Um, now landlords must also have one of the eight just causes to terminate a tenancy or um, begin an eviction. Uh, and also the ordinance provides for a rent adjustment and a fair return petition process. So both landlord and tenant can petition um, the rent board to either increase or decrease their rent. Um, and I'll go over that in a second. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so here is a brief overview of the Richmond Rent Ordinance. Um, you can actually go through the whole thing, Paige. Thank you. All right, so as you can see, it's really broken up into two major pillars. And in fact, most rent control jurisdictions have the exact same type of structure. Um, sometimes they do have a third pillar, which is the um, return of a security deposit interest requirement, but um, Richmond's ordinance does not have that. So right now, well, all you have to look at or understand is there's two pillars. One is rent control and the other is just cause for eviction protection. So let's talk about rent control. So rents are regulated. The maximum allowable rent, again, called the MAR, is calculated by taking the base rent and then you add in any applicable annual general adjustments. Also, um, should the landlord file an individual rent adjustment and receive an order saying, you know, it's granted, then they'll also be increased. Um, the annual general adjustment um, is 100% of the consumer price index of Bay Area, also known as the inflation rate. Um, and then uh, the petition process is the mechanism to increase or decrease the MAR based on reasons permitted by the rent ordinance. The base rent requires rents to be rolled back to the rent that is in effect as of July 15, 2015, excuse me, July 21st, 2015, or the first rent charge for tenants that moved in after July 21st, 2015. Now the eviction protections aspect, um, a landlord needs to have at least one of these eight just causes uh, in order to terminate a tenancy. Um, those eight just causes are listed. Um, to, then the first one is the most common, failure to pay rent. Second one is breach of the lease. Third one is nuisance. Nuisance is considered um, a catch-all. It can vary in terms of what that means. It can be uh, destruction of property. It can be uh, you know bothering other tenants. It could be loud parties. It can be all kinds of stuff. Um, number four is failure to give access to the landlord when they had a lawful right to do so. Number five is a, uh, to temporarily vacate um, 
a tenant in order to undertake substantial repairs. Now remember that's a temporary eviction. It's, you cannot evict a tenant permanently in order to take those repairs. Um, number six is an owner move-in or an owner relative move-in. So that's when I'm the owner and I want to move into the unit to live there as my principal place of residence, or I want say my son to live there as his principal place of residence. And there are various restrictions and requirements for that um, particular one. Uh, as well as a relocation fee owed to the tenants who get displaced. Um, <clears throat> the next one is the withdrawal from the rental market, um, which is also known as the Ellis Act. And then I can't really see, I think the eighth one is the temporary tenancy. Um, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, my screen is um, not showing it that much. Um, but yeah, so that's in the case of a single family home where a landlord previously lived in the unit, but says to a tenant, sure, you can live here for up to 12 months, but after those 12 months, you have to vacate. So that's a very specific type of eviction. All right, next slide, please. All right, so which properties are covered by the rent ordinance? So the first one is fully covered. So these are completely fully controlled rental units. That means that those tenancies receive not only rent regulation or rent control, but also just cause for eviction protection. Um, so this applies to multi-unit properties built on or before February 1, 1995, most of them at least. Um, so there, it's kind of odd. Uh, rent control is usually, the, the ordinances are written in a way that says basically all, properties are rent controlled, but there are exceptions. And so the following are the exceptions to that rule. So the next one is partially covered. Um, so partially covered units means that you only receive the just cause um, protection, uh, not rent control. So that means that the rent is completely unregulated. So that could mean subsidized units, including section eight tenancies, properties with one dwelling on one parcel, such as a single family home, um, condominiums, and any new construction. So things that were built after February 1st, 1995. And by the way, Casa Hawkins, which is a state law, requires that the units be permitted with a certificate of occupancy in order to get that date. Um, then the last category is fully exempt units. So these units don't have any type of rent regulation. They don't have any just cause protection. It's, it's kind of as if they don't, they're not even in Richmond. They're in some other place where there's just no rent control. So these, some of these are examples um, are landlord and tenant, where the landlord and tenant share a kitchen or a bath. Um, single family homes where there's a permitted uh, accessory dwelling unit, also known as an ADU. Um, was added and the main house is owner occupied um, and retirement homes as well. Um, Paige, I can't see the bottom of my screen. Is there, uh, I'm sorry, hold on one second. I can't see what's after retirement homes if there is anything. There isn't anything. Okay, all right. So that's it. So that's kind of an overview of the three types of designations. So remember, it's fully covered, partially covered, and fully exempt. All right, next slide, please. All right, so this is a, a graph that uh, some one of our staff members created to kind of explain where um, these types of properties would fall under the rent ordinance, specifically in the context of accessory dwelling units. So on the right side, you see a key. Um, o is going to mean that the, it's owner occupied. T is to mean that the tenant occupies it. The larger uh, building means that that's the main house. And then the smaller square, either solid lined or dotted line, is the uh, accessory dwelling unit. A solid line would mean that it's permitted, and a dotted line means it's unpermitted. So if you have an owner, so the first one is like, so if you see an owner in the main house and there's a tenant in the accessory dwelling unit and it's permitted, right, because it's a solid line, then the ADU is exempt from both rent control and just cause. It's completely exempt. There's no rent regulation. There's no just cause protection. Um, in the second example, again, the owner lives in the main house, but then the ADU is 
unpermitted. So there's the difference here, right? Because now you have an ADU, but they didn't provide the proper permit. This completely changes the analysis. So the second unit is now fully rent controlled and has just cause. So the mere fact that the landlord did not get the permit totally changes the analysis and that tenant would be fully rent controlled. Um, if both units are tenant occupied and the second unit is permitted, then the main house is under rent control and just cause, fully rent control. But the ADU is partially covered, so it only receives just cause. Um, the next one, it says that if, if both units are tenant occupied and the second unit is not permitted, so again, tenants in the house and in the ADU, but the, sec the ADU is not permitted, then both units receive full rent control and just cause. And in the last one, uh, if the main house is tenant occupied and the second unit is owner occupied, so this is a unique situation where the tenant is in the main house, the owner lives in the ADU. Um, well, obviously the owner is not under any type of rent control or just they're not a tenant, right? They're the owner. So you're just looking at the house, then the main house is under rent control and just cause, fully rent control. Right? So that's kind of a breakdown of the ADU. All right, next slide, please. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the just cause for eviction uh, and eviction noticing requirements. And the following couple pages apply to both fully covered and partially covered units. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is under that RMC is Richmond Municipal Code uh, 11.100.050. Um, residential tenants can only be evicted for one of the following just causes, and the notice must state the reason failure to pay rent, right? After being served a three-day notice to pay rent or quit, the tenant doesn't pay that rent, then the landlord has the ability to file and say, well, they didn't pay the rent, I'm gonna go try to evict. Um, breach of lease. If a tenant continues to violate a lease after being warned in writing to cease those violations, so say for example, you have a lease uh, provision that says you cannot have a dog, a pet, uh, and then you get a pet. Um, the landlord gives you a warning and then says, this is a breach of the lease and you don't get rid of the pet, that could be a reason to evict. Uh, nuisance. So um, as I said before, nuisance is somewhat of a catch-all. Um, there's no, uh, I mean, there is some types of definitions, but it doesn't, it's not defined by one type of act, I guess is my point. It can be a, a variance of different things, um, including, you know, like I said, parties, uh, violent dogs or you know trash or you know there's all kinds of stuff it's, it's kind of a catch-all um, the next one is failure to give access so if a tenant continues to deny a landlord lawful entry per civil code 1954 after receiving a written warning to cease denying lawful entry so when the landlord follows the law civil code 1954 and i'll be discussing that uh, in a little bit um, then the, the tenant can, can, cannot continue to deny them because the landlord had a lawful right to enter. And so that could be a reason to institute an eviction or at least initiate one. Um, the next one is to temporarily vacate a tenant in order to undertake substantial repairs. Um, so again, that's a temporary eviction. So uh, may, you know, let's just say there just needs to be a ton of work done on the unit and the tenant cannot safely be there while the work is being done. Well, that means that the, and then the tenant doesn't want to go though. Well, that could be a reason to evict the tenant temporarily so that the landlord can perform their duties to upkeep the unit. Um, and I'll explain the asterisk in a second. Um, the next one is an owner move-in. So that's when the owner or their relative wishes to move into the unit as their principal place of residence. Um, for a minimum of at least three years. Um, the next one is uh, the withdrawal from the rental market, also known as the Ellis Act. Um, so that's a very restrictive type of eviction um, and uh, it carries not only uh, the relocation fees that I'll talk about in a second, but also um, it just carries restrictions in terms of renting and uh, for a certain amount of years. So it's a very particular type of eviction. Uh, and then the last one is the temporary tenancy, which I've mentioned before is where um, the landlord had lived in the house 
or the unit um, beforehand and says to, and the tenant wants to live there for up to 12 months, then that landlord can say, sure, but uh, you need to be out by the end of this 12 months. And that has to be written in the lease agreement. Um, so the just causes here that have asterisks, so, so that's the temporarily uh, vacate in order to undertake substantial repairs, owner move in and withdraw from the rental market. All three of those evictions and only those three types of evictions require a relocation payment to be paid to the tenant. Um, and it varies in terms of how much, depending on various factors, like how many bedrooms there are, what types of tenants there are, um, if there are any you know, senior, disabled, if there are children, that kind of thing. Um, and that's all outlined by the rel relocation ordinance that was established by the city council. And that's under Richmond Municipal Code 11.102. Um, and if you ever receive a notice of termination of tenancy and for any of these reasons, it's highly recommended that you contact the rent program at 510-234-7368. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so these are the written warning notice requirements. So this is in the instance where um, it's, these are specific evictions. So this type of notice must be served prior to a notice of termination of tenancy if the just cause for eviction is either breach of lease, nuisance, failure to give access. That's it. Uh, this is the only ones where you have to give that warning letter to the tenant first to say, hey, this is a problem. You need to kind of fix it or else. So there are some rules about this. So first of all, the written warning notice must be served within a reasonable period, and under our ordinance, that's no less than five days prior to serving the notice of termination of tenancy. So um, they have to allow five days after they distribute the warning notice to see what happens. That's basically what that says. Um, the notice must also state that the failure to cure may result in an eviction. It must also inform the tenant of their right to request a reasonable accommodation, should they need one. Um, and it, it shall include the contact number of the rent program. It shall also include constructions for compliance, so how to you know, avoid the eviction. Um, and then it shall also include information necessary to determine the date, time, place, and witnesses present and other circumstances. So. Um, they're supposed to provide all this information in the warning notice so that the tenant can really understand what is the issue, what do I need to do. All right, next slide. Please. All right, so in these noticing rules, when it comes to an eviction, and this is under one of our regulations, um, landlords must submit a copy of any eviction notice served on a tenant within two business days of having served the tenant. So again, they have to serve it to you, with, to the tenant, within two business days of you receiving it. Um, and then the failure to do so it could be considered an affirmative defense um, to the eviction. The landlord must submit this uh, uh, form in an online form on the rent program's website and then upload a copy of the notice with a proof of service. And by the way, I forgot to mention that when they give a warning notice, it's good that landlords should usually give that proof of service. Um, when they do an eviction notice, they have to provide a proof of service and they have to upload it. Um, this noticing requirement does not apply to properties or units that are exempt from the just cause provisions of the rent ordinance. So these requirements, if you're fully exempt, are just not going to apply. The landlord does not have to upload any notice to our agency. Okay. All right, so we'll be discussing um, now just kind of how the rent regulation aspects work. So we're talking about the maximum allowable rent, known as the MAR, the base rent, the annual general adjustment or the AGA, and then rent increase noticing requirements. And these following nine or 10 slides um, only apply to the fully rent controlled property. All right, next slide. Okay, so the maximum allowable rent. So this is the maximum, absolute maximum rent that can be charged for a controlled rental unit. A rent increase cannot exceed the maximum allowable rent, but it can be less. So again, 
the max is the ceiling. But if they choose to charge less than the max, that's fine. There's nothing illegal about that. Um, even if the maximum rent is not charged, the maximum allowable rent remains the same. And so the landlord may choose to raise the rent to the maximum in accordance with, they should say, st state law, not sale law, and the rent forwards banking regulation. Um, it also, so the maximum allowable rent, as I said before, equals the base rent. So that's always the initial starting point. What is the base rent? Then you look at how many applicable annual general adjustments can be applied. And if there are any uh, petitions that have been approved through the petition process, you add all these up and that gives you the maximum allowable rent. All right, so part of the ordinance, um, there was this creation of the base rent and in order to do that um, rent needed to be rolled back so <clears throat> under the ordinance rents are required to be rolled back to the rent in effect on july 21st 2015 or the rent in effect on the first date <clears throat> that the rent was charged uh, after july 21st 2015. so if you look below there's this example right and you start on the left so in September of 2014, this tenancy began. And let's just say the rent was $1,000. Um, on July 21st, 2015, the tenant was paying $1,000. So that's the base rent. Um, in December of 2015, the rent was raised to 1100. Now remember, all this time, this is not, the rent ordinance was not in effect yet. So there's nothing wrong with what, what they were doing. But on December 30th, 2016, the rent order goes into effect, it becomes law. And so um, on that date, the rent is supposed to be rolled back to $1,000. Because remember, um, on July 21st, if you look on that pink box, 2015, the tenant was paying $1,000. So it's irrelevant that the landlord raised the rent after that, because when the rent warrants came into effect, the landlord had to roll it back to the thousand dollars because that was what the tenant was paying on July 21st, 2015. Um, and then in February 2017, after the proper notice, the landlord increased the rent allowed by the 2016 uh, AGA. All right, next slide. Please. All right, so this is another example of how the max allowable rent would work. So again, using the thousand dollar initial base rent. So on the left side, you see there's a thousand dollars. That's the starting point. Rent in effect, July 21st, 2015. On December 3rd, 2016, um, and then uh, you can see the subsequent dates after that, the rent was raised per the AGA every year. They raised it by 3%, raised the rent to 1,030, then 3.4%, so you add 3.4% on the 1,030, you get 1,065 and two cents. And then it keeps going up 3.6% to $1,103 and 36 cents. And then the last uh, one for the AGA of uh, 2019 was 3.5%, so it gets raised to $1,141 and 98 cents. Um, and by the way, the note on the bottom says that AGA rent increases are not automatic right? Um, rent increases may only take effect if a tenancy began prior to September 1 of the previous year and after a proper 30-day notice has been filed with the rent board. Um, so again, the AGA will, um, you know, it will potentially increase the MAR. However, it's up to the landlord as to when the, and if they issue a rent increase notice because your rent cannot go up unless the landlord provides proper written notice. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> all right, so these are the all of the annual general adjustments for the last several years. So the first one in 2016 was 3%. The second one in 2017 was 3.4%. The 2018 AGA was 3.6%. The 2019 AGA was 3.5%. And then the newest AGA, which was just released, um, but will become effective as, as of uh, September 1st, is 2.9%. So those are all the AGAs um, over the years. Um, 
Now it says at the bottom, a landlord must give the tenant proper notice of a rent increase per California Civil Code 827. Again, that's state law. Um, so they have to provide at least 30 days notice for any rent increase up to 10%. If, they if the landlord wants to increase it beyond 10%, it's a 90 day notice, 90 uh, under that same civil code. Um, yeah, so the, again, the 2.9%, even though the numbers are out, landlords cannot take effect of those numbers until September 1st, uh, the 2.9% until September 1st. All right, next slide, please. So this is the AGA again. So what is the AGA and how is it calculated? So it's in the annual allowable cost of living increase based on 100% of the consumer price index of the Bay Area, which is the inflation rate. <clears throat> and these, by the way, are produced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So it's a federal uh, regulation that produce these numbers. Um, when can the first AGA be taken after the new tenancy starts? So um, it must be one full count, one full calendar year must expire after September 1st of each year. So it's full year after September 1st. Um, when during the year can the AGA be taken? The AGA can be taken on September 1st of each year after proper legal notice. So again, they have to provide that notice no matter what. Um, can landlords bank AGA increases? So let's just say a landlord didn't implement the AGAs over the years, and now the MAR has gone up, but the tenant's rent has not. So then all of a sudden the landlord's like, oh, all these AGAs, can I do them all at once? Well, not really. They can catch up, right? They can bank them. Um, but there's a limit. So yes, you can bank previously unapplied AGAs, but there's a limit of 5% of previously deferred AGAs uh, can be recovered each year plus the current year's AGA. So that means, for example, um, if you take this year's, which is still 3.5%, uh, and you add 5% to that, that's 8.5%. So in max, even if the landlord had mo all of the AGAs before, which goes well beyond 8.5%, for this year, they can only add on 8.5% max. The rest of the AGAs that were unapplied, they'll have to wait till next year to apply. Um, for information on banking, you can look at Regulation 602, and that's on our website as well. All right. <clears throat> so, what are the requirements for taking an AGA rent increase? Well, there's two parts to this. Um, there's noticing requirements and there's the administrative requirements as well. So, the noticing requirements we kind of already said, uh, but um, you, they do have to provide you proper written notice, um, but they also have to provide the rent program with a copy of the rent increase with a proof of service that they provided to the tenant within 10 business days of serving the tenant. So again, they have to provide that and upload that notice with the proof of service within 10 business days of issuing the notice to the tenant. Um, as far as the administrative requirements, the landlords must be in co compliance with all aspects of the rent ordinance, including enrollment of their rental property. So they have to enroll themselves as a landlord with our program. Um, they have to complete the tenancy registration form to register the individual tenancies. So what the rent is, what services, how many tenants, that kind of thing. Um, they have to pay a rental housing fee, uh, and that's per unit, uh, and it's an annual fee. The rent had to have been rolled back, and any overcharges had to have been refunded to the tenant. So all of those things must be there in order for a landlord to take an AGA rent increase. Now remember, that there's a small reminder in the corner there, that only properties that are subject to the rent control provisions of the ordinance must file rent increases with the rent program. So it, as we said before, not all properties are fully rent controlled. So for example, a single family home those types of units are not rent controlled and therefore any rent increase that those tenants receive, the, the notice does not have to be filed with the rent program. 
All right, next slide. Okay, so when can rents be raised to market? Um, so when there is a voluntary vacancy and a new tenancy starts. And by the way, this is uh, basically based off of a state law uh, known as the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act. This is a law that was passed in the 1996, um, and it is basically established in what's called vacancy B control. Um, prior to this date and prior to the passage of this law, rent control is actually continuous, meaning that if I had a rent controlled unit and I left, the next tenant would actually receive my rental rate. But that all stopped in, 19, in 1996, 97. Um, and they, it, the law says basically whenever there's a brand new tenancy, the, the landlord can go to market, period. They can always do that, even in a rent controlled, or sorry, specifically in a rent controlled jurisdiction. This law was passed specifically to address rent control jurisdiction. Um, so again, they can be raised to market when there's a voluntary vacancy and a new tenancy starts. Two, when all the original occupants or leaseholders vacate and only holdover subtenants or occupants remain in the unit. So sometimes you have this, um, especially I used to see, um, uh, I used to work at Berkeley uh, rent control program I used to see this a lot because it was a lot of college students, a lot of turnover and that kind of thing. And so there's a lot of questions about this. So basically, if you have tenant A, B, and C, um, and you can have A and B leave, but C is still there, that means that the, the unit remains rent controlled. But as soon as C leaves, that's a, and there's still, and there's, there's other tenants like E, F, and G, then that unit can, those, that rent can be raised to market. Um, the third one is if the tenant no longer lives in the unit as her pr primary resident. So i.e. the lease holding tenant is subletting or using the unit as a vacation home. So um, I actually did a, a rent hearing, rent board hearing when I was practicing in San Francisco. Um, and it was exactly this case where the landlord alleged that the tenant was not living there because uh, she thought that uh, she wasn't living there as a primary resident. So she filed a petition with the San Francisco, this is again in San Francisco, um, uh, with the San Francisco rent board to try to raise it to market. But, you know, the tenant was living there. She just traveled a lot. So basically she got denied and so she couldn't do it. Um, but again, there are situations where a tenant doesn't live there. You know, they had just keep it renting, but that's not the pr primary residence. And then in that situation, a landlord can raise the rent to market. Okay, so this is kind of what I was talking about a little bit earlier. So what is vacancy, vacancy decontrol and recontrol? Oops. Um, so um, here in the example, a tenancy starts. So in March 15th, uh, landlord tenant contract for $1,000 rent, garbage, water, and parking included. Okay, so um, so again, this is March 2015. Uh, the rent increases by the rent increases by three percent to 1,030, and then 2017, the rent increases by 3.4 percent to 1,065 dollars and two cents. Um, now, in the next part, the new tenancy starts, or all the original occupants have vacated. So basically, they're all gone. All those tenants are gone. And then in 2018, the landlord recessed the rent to 1450 in contracts with a new tenant where parking is not included. So basically, this is just simply to illustrate that when they start a new tenancy, the landlord can re not only reset the rent, but also reset any services or basically anything with the contract, as long as the landlord and the tenant agree. They are not bound by the rent or anything that was provided to the previous tenant. This is, it's just like hitting the reset button. So it's just a start, fresh start, clean start, new. And the landlord can choose and then the tenant can decide if they want to engage in that tenant. And then, so again, that vague, so the rent was controlled, but then when in 2018, the landlord reset the rent, it was decontrolled and they chose a new rent. So that's now 1450, but again, once that new rent is chosen, now it's now it's controlled. So now the landlord is 
set under the 1450 and all the AGA is based on that 1450. Okay, next slide, please. All right, rent adjustment petition. So these are, we're gonna discuss both tenant and landlord petitions. Um, so these are the examples of a, of what, or the reasons why a tenant can file for a petition. So the first one is the petition for excessive rent due to failure on behalf of the landlord to roll back the rent or for just simply charging rent above the maximum allowable rent. So this is a straightforward overcharge. So the landlord just didn't roll it back or they just increased the rent well beyond what was the allowable legal limit. A tenant can file a petition to challenge that and get the, that money back if, if that is in fact true. If they were illegally overcharging, then the tenant is owed that money back. And moving forward, they cannot continue to charge that excessive rent. Um, again, assuming that the tenant wins in the petition. Um, the next one is a petition to reduce the rent due to a decrease in space, services, or habitability. So this is a very common one as well. Um, a lot of times tenants will file petitions because, um, you know, in their opinion, the landlord has failed to provide them habitable unit. You know, there could be all kinds of problems. There could be rats and mold and no heat or no water or whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that can happen. And in that case, um, the tenant could file a petition to say, well, you know, I deserve to have a habitable space. And we'll talk about the implied warranty of habitability in a little bit. Um, and therefore I'm, I'm actually overpaid you. So you owe me some money back. Um, and then there's the petition to reduce rent due to a reduction in the number of tenants allowed. So this is an interesting one. So basically um, if a landlord allows the tenant to, um, to have uh, you know, let's say they start out with four tenants, but then two of the tenants, um, you know, they leave, but then the, and then the tenants are like, all right, well, we want to get, you know, back to four. So the landlord says, no, I don't want you to do that. Well, that means then tenants could then file a petition to reduce the rent by the percentage of tenants that were not allowed to come back in so in this case though if you're you start with four and the landlord says no you can't get you know and to leave and you can't get to you know go back to four that means that 50 percent of the tenants are now gone so that means the petition could say i'm asking for a 50 percent rent reduction because the landlord is not allowing me to get back to that uh four tenant number um Important petition facts. So one, the landlord always has a right to object, right? This is the process. So it's not automatic. Um, the landlord always has this right to object for whatever reason. Um, most petitions and almost all habitability petitions will result in a hearing conducted by a hearing examiner. So that's when we bring, well, we used to before the pandemic, bring in all the parties and have them sit down and then, uh, Kind of similar to a court hearing the hearing examiner who's basically considered an administrative law judge would hear both sides look at the evidence and um, either attempt to um, you know have a mediation or settlement or um, have will ultimately have to make a decision um, but now obviously because you know the pandemic that the physical you know that's coming together is not going to happen, at least not for a while, so hearings are going to be done remotely. Um, some petitions will be decided administratively if no objection is filed by the other party and the facts of the case are straightforward or not disputed. Um, and then either party can appeal the hearing examiner's decision to the full rent board. So um, there's always an appeal possible um, where you can present, well, when the case is brought forth to the full rent board and they will make the decision on whether or not to grant the appeal. Um, and then there's even one step further. If that appeal is rejected, um, then the, the, the petitioner or the person can actually uh, seek a writ. So they means they would have to actually go to court to try to appeal that after that one is rejected. All right. 
Next slide, please. Okay, so these are the landlord rent adjustment petitions. So the first one is the petition to increase the maximum allowable rent, the MAR, due to an increase in the number of occupants allowed. So um, if there is uh, an increase of occupants that are people who are you know, not, on the, not part of the original agreement um, and the landlord, landlord allows it, the landlord can actually petition to increase the rent by 15% per additional occupant. Now there's an asterisk there because um, not all uh, new occupants will qualify for an increase. So for example, if it's your child, right? Children of a tenant, you cannot charge uh, a rent increase for, landlords cannot increase that. And there's other exceptions as well. So it just really depends on who, who's the additional occupant. Um, there's a petition to increase the maximum allowable rent due to an increase in space or services. So um, let's just say they added on a, you know, a room or a deck or something like that, or basically just made it better. And in theory, the landlord could file a petition to increase the rent uh, due to an increase in space. Um, there's also, and this is probably the most common one, the petition to increase the maximum allowable rent due to increases in net operating and maintenance costs. So this is called the um, MNOI petition for landlords. And basically if they have certain expenses and those expenses are you know, exceeding their income, they may be some uh, ability to increase the rent. But these petitions are fairly complicated and, and require quite a bit of documentation and um, uh, proof and uh, it's, it's a lot of numbers. Those are actually pretty difficult uh, cases, but um, you know, landlords still have that right. Um, so just as um, landlords have a right to petition to tenant, or excuse me, landlords have a right to object to a tenant petition, a tenant has a right to object to a landlord's petition, just the same. Um, most petitions and almost all habitability, habitability petitions will result in a hearing conducted by a hearing examiner. And some just like you know, the tenant one, some of these petitions will be decided administratively if no objection is filed by the other party and the facts of the case are straightforward or not disputed. And again, either party can appeal the hearing examiner's decision. <clears throat> okay, so this is just an overview of some important California state law. Um, so the first one that we'll talk about is the implied warranty of habitability, the implied covenant of covenant of quiet enjoyment, and some uh, associated laws there. We'll talk about um, security deposit law, which is Civil Code 1950.5, the landlord entry law, Civil Code 1954, um, proper notice for terminating tenancies, which is Civil Code 1946 and 1946.1, um, the rent increase notice law, which is Civil Code 827 and the lease breaking law, which is civil code 1951.2. And I also added on some additional codes, which I'll discuss at the end. Okay, next slide. All right, so this is a bit uh, wordy, but uh, I want to, to be honest, it's, it's as short as I could get it. <laughs> um, so the implied warranty of habitability, implied covenant of quiet enjoyment. So um, these are both implied by law. So meaning that in every California residential lease, even if it's not stated anywhere in the lease, it is implied by law to be a part of your lease. So the first one is the implied warranty of habitability. Um, this is a legal theory, which has been developed and defined through various court cases. The California Supreme Court has expressed that the implied warranty of habitability exists in all residential rental agreements. And there's a, a court case there that um, that's cited from. This means that it is the landlord's duty and promise to provide tenants with safe and sanitary housing as defined in Civil Code 1941.1 and Health and Safety Code 17920.3 in exchange for collecting rent. So they are promising this. They are saying, we promise to provide you a habitable unit and to comply with these codes. Similarly, implied in every California resident, residential lease is an implied covenant of quiet enjoyment, or otherwise known as quiet possession. 
uh, guaranteeing that tenants will be able to peacefully enjoy their home. And this is under California Civil Code 1927. This quiet possession includes two requirements. First, the landlord may not take an action that substantially interferes with tenants' lawful use of their home. Second, the landlord must take action to provide a tenant with a quiet enjoyment or quiet possession of the tenant's home if the landlord is aware that the tenant's lawful use of the property is jeopardized. So this last one, um, you know, it says that the landlord must take action. You know, that that's a kind of a, a general word, right? I mean, action doesn't mean that they have to, you know, do everything under the sun. Um, so this comes up quite a bit. So for example, I, you know, I get a lot of calls like multi-unit properties and there's a noise issue, right? One tenant's quiet and the other one's like they're living below someone with kids, for example. Um, and then the tenant is saying, hey, landlord, like I, you know, I, I can't enjoy my unit. I need my quiet, I need my rest. Um, now the action that the landlord could take is, you know, it's somewhat limited. The fact of the matter is that, you know, people are people and they're going to make some noise. And so there's always this kind of balancing act that they have to determine. It's like, well, how bad is it? Um, and, you know, kids making noise, that's a harder one because kids make noise. Um, but at the same time, if it's a legit complaint, the landlord has to take action. So meaning they have to probably provide just like a warning notice or something like that. And then if it gets more and more severe or they just, it just doesn't stop, then they can consider other, you know, more severe um, actions like, um, you know, issuing three-day notices and even potentially an eviction. Okay, next slide. All right, California Civil Code 1941.1. This is quite a lot of stuff. But basically, like I said, um, the landlord must provide a, a property that is in habitable condition and fit to live in for humans, right? We, we need certain things to live. Um, and landlords must repair problems that make the property uninhabitable, except for problems caused by the tenant or their guests, children, or pets. In order for the property to be habitable, it must have all of the following. So it says, you know, wa effective waterproofing, weather protection of roof and exterior walls. So weather protection usually means like out so out outside paint, uh, including unbroken windows and doors. Um, then there's plumbing facilities, gas facilities, heating facilities, electrical systems, trash, you know, it kind of goes on. Uh, and so you can read that for yourself, but basically these are some of the minimum standards that is codified in state law that says this is what is required for human habitation. All right, next slide, please. All right, again, this is a fairly voluminous um, law that I really, I couldn't put all of the, uh, the law in this slide, but um, you can always look it up. Um, so again, any building or portion thereof, including any dwelling unit, guest room, or suite of rooms, or the premises on which the same is located, in which there exists any of the following listed conditions to an extent that endangers the life, limb, health, property, safety, or welfare of the public, or the occupants thereof, shall be deemed and hereby is declared to be a substandard building. So this one gets a bit more specific. Um, again, I didn't put in all of the law. It actually goes on for a few pages, but it talks about lack of hot, cold running water, lack of adequate heating, dampness in habitable rooms, visible mold growth, right? General dilapidation. Um, so it gets more specific um, and even says, you know, inadequate sanitation shall include but not limited to the following, lack, you know, all this stuff. And so basically, there is quite a lot that this covers, but it also says, you know, like general dilapidation, improper maintenance. I mean, these are catch-alls. These are things that may, you know, uh, depending on the facts of what is the problem, what's the issue, there may be a violation here. And therefore, there may be a violation of the implied warranty of habitability. And therefore, a tenant could, in theory, file a petition for a failure of, on the part of the landlord to fix or remedy these issues. All right. Next slide, please. All right, similarly to 
landlord responsibilities, um, this civil code actually talks about what the tenant's responsibilities are. So there is a law that says this. So it says that a tenant must take reasonable care of the rented property in common areas, such as hallways. This means that the tenant must keep those areas in good condition. A tenant must also repair all damage that he or she causes or that is caused by a tenant's guests, children, or pets. So, you know, guests included. So if you have a party and they break something, you are going to be responsible. Um, California Civil Code Section 1941.2 requires that the tenant do all of the following. Keep the premises as clean and sanitary as the condition of the premises uh, as, sorry, as the condition of the premises permits. Use and operate gas, electrical, and plumbing fixtures properly. Examples of improper use including, uh, include overloading electrical outlets, flushing large foreign objects on the toilet, and allowing any gas, electrical, or plumbing fixture to become filthy. Dispose of trash and garbage in a clean and sanitary manner. Um, not destroy, damage, or deface the premises or allow anyone else to do so. Do not remove any part of the structure, dwelling unit, facilities, equipment, or appurtenances, or allow anyone else to do so. Use the premises to live and use the rooms for their proper purposes. For example, the bedroom must be used as a bedroom and not as a kitchen. And notify the landlord when deadbolt locks and window locks or security devices do not operate properly. Now, that note, that last part, notifying the landlord, it, it, it's actually super applicable to any issue, right? The name of the game in habitability concerns for a tenant or really anyone, landlords too, is documentation. So if there's an issue in, um, you know, if you look at the previous slides and you say, hey, there's this mold, there's this leak, there's no heat, you have to let the landlord know and put them on notice of the issue or else you cannot claim that, you know, you're owed a rent reduction, for example. You never let them know. So why would they, how could they fix it? Right, so documentation is extremely key whenever you're talking about any type of habitability issue. The number one thing is always, always, always notify your landlord or management company or whoever you are regularly in contact with. All right, next slide. Okay, so here's the next couple of slides are about the security deposit law. Um, <clears throat> so this is under California Civil Code 1950.5. So what is a security deposit? So under the law, it says any payment, fee, deposit, or charge imposed at the beginning of a tenancy as an advanced payment of rent or to be used for recovering rent defaults, repairing damages caused by tenant or cleaning. This does not include an application or screening fee. The first month's rent isn't considered a security deposit, but money paid in excess of the first month's rent, including what is called last month's rent, is considered part of the deposit. So if the landlord says, I want for you to move in here, I want first month's rent, I want a security deposit, and I want last month's rent. Well, the last two are added together are actually the deposit. So whenever they say security deposit, last month's rent, you add those two together, that's your security deposit. Um, how much can a landlord collect for a security deposit? So again, this is under the state law. A secured deposit may not exceed two times the monthly rent for an unfurnished unit or three times the monthly rent for a furnished unit. So again, they cannot charge more than twice the rent for a deposit if it's an unfurnished unit, which most are. <clears throat> um, so what can a landlord deduct from the security deposit? So a landlord can deduct for um, a few specific reasons. It's not just anything they want. Um, so they may deduct from a tenant security deposit only the amount that is reasonably necessary to one, cover any rent default. So if there's any unpaid rent, they can deduct from that for that. Two, to repair damages that a tenant or a tenant's guest caused other than normal wear and tear. And by the way, lots of people ask, what is normal wear and tear? Uh, unfortunately, the law doesn't give a definition, but um, it's been pretty much agreed that um, the definition of wear and tear expands um, as the length of the tenancy expands. So if you have a one-year tenancy, your wear and tear is going to be 
kind of narrowly defined. Whereas if you've lived there for 25 years, right, the wear and tear, they, there's going to be a lot more leeway with that. Um, they can also deduct uh, to do necessary cleaning to return the unit to the same level of cleanliness as, it, as at the beginning of the tenancy. So again, same level. You never have to return a property to the back to the landlord in better condition than it was when you first found it. So it's actually super important to document the condition of the unit when you first move in before you put down any um, of your things. Just do a quick run through with a video or take a bunch of pictures or however you want to do it because um, that's going to be key uh, after you leave. And four, if allowed by the lease to cover, they can deduct to cover the cost of restoring or replacing personal property, including keys or furniture, excluding ordinary wear and tear. But again, that has to be included in the lease. Um, so landlords are obligated to offer a walkthrough. Remember, that's offer a walkthrough. Uh, inspection at the end of the tenancy. So tenants have a right to a walkthrough inspection no earlier than two weeks prior to the date that they're going to vacate. The landlord must give 48 hours prior written notice of the inspection unless the tenant waives this requirement in writing. So basically if the land the tenant talk and they're just like yeah I want you to come by on a Tuesday at two o'clock then no notice is really required. The purpose of the inspection is to identify needed cleaning for the tenant to perform before moving out so as to avoid deductions from the deposit. Now, immediately after the inspection, the landlord must provide an itemized list of repairs and cleaning that needs to be done to avoid authorized deductions. Now, the landlord may still deduct for cleaning or repairs that were not identified during the, the inspection because they were concealed by the tenant's belongings. So, you know, they could change, but the, it helps to um, do the walkthrough because then you're both kind of on the same page as what needs to be done. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so when does the security deposit have to be returned to the tenant? Well, the law says that within 21 days after the tenants leave the unit, the landlord must, one, furnish the tenant with a written statement itemizing, itemizing the amount of and purpose for any deductions from the security deposit. They have to kind of list it out. Two, they have to return any remaining portion of the deposit um, to the tenant. And where several roommates live together and have paid a deposit uh, together, the landlord is not required to return to the deposit until the unit is returned to the landlord vacant. So, you know, tenants A, B, and C have a unit together um, and then A and B leave. The landlord is not under obligation to return the deposit to A and B yet because C has not left. So it's not until it's all vacant. Um, there's also a requirement to provide an itemized statement of landlord's charges along with the receipt. Um, if more than $125 is deducted from the deposit for cleaning and repairs together, the landlord must attach the itemized statement, copies of documents showing the landlord's charges and costs to clean and repair the unit. So again, in a then no matter what, if they take out one dollar, they always have to prov to provide that written statement. But if they take out more than one hundred twenty-five dollars, they have to also provide um, the receipts, work orders. Basically, they have to provide the documents to support all of their deductions. Um, the effect of a sale on a deposit. So a landlord who sells a rental property must either one transfer the, the deposit to the new landlord, or two, return the deposit to the tenant. They cannot keep it, right? Um, it's your money. It's really the tenant's money. And so they either have to provide it to the new landlord so they can now be the holder of it, and then they would have to follow these laws, or just give it back to the tenant. Now, a tenant's uh, recourse, meaning their option to challenge a uh, a landlord if the deposit is not returned within 21 days of vacating or it's they do return it within 21 days but it's you know the chart they do disagree with the charges um you can actually go to court so a tenant who does not receive the refund and accounting within 21 days or disputes the amounts claimed by the landlord may sue the landlord for the disputed amount uh, in small claims court again uh, in small claims court, you can only ask for up to $10,000. 
that's the maximum allowable. Um, you can also allege twice the amount of the deposit for bad faith retention. So this means that there was an unreasonable refusal to return um, any security. So basically if the landlord just kept the money, they didn't provide any documentation, they didn't give it back to them in 21 days. You know, that could be an argument to say, well, I think that's bad faith. And then if that happens, actually, um, if you allege bad faith, you can actually allege twice two times the damages in addition to the damage that you already suffered from the deposit. So say, for example, your deposit was $1,000 and they kept all $1,000 in bad faith. Under this law, you can actually claim twice the amount of deposits, that's $2,000 in statutory damages, in addition to the $1,000 that you were never given back. So in total, your claim is now $3,000. But uh, bad faith retention in court does require it, the onus is on the um, the the tenant to, to prove that bad faith, and that's kind of a hard um, claim to prove. Um, in court, the landlord simply has to prove that the amounts retained were reasonable, um, or they have to provide some type of explanation as to why they didn't comply with the law. Um, but then it's up to a judge whether or not you get um, some or all of your deposit back. It's up to them. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is now um, Civil Code 1954. Um, this is talked about landlords, uh, excuse me, lawful landlord entry. So landlords may only enter to make necessary or agreed repairs, decorations, alterations, or improvements, um, supply necessary or agreed services or to exhibit the dwelling to prospective or actual purchasers, mortgagees, tenants, workers, or contractors, or to make an inspection pursuant to section 1950.5, which is the security deposit law we just talked about. So again, those are the only reasons. Landlords cannot create a reason outside of law to enter. Right? Oh, I, I just wanna come in and you know take a look, see how you're living. Nope, can't do that. Um, Landlords must give the tenant written notice, prior written notice to enter at least 24 hours prior to the entry. Again, every entry, they have to provide at least 24 hours written notice. <clears throat> the landlord does not need to provide written or verbal notice to enter in cases of emergency, right? That's an exception, but they, in that case, they do have to leave the notice afterwards saying, I had to come in uh, to put out, you know, turn off your water because it was flooding, something like that. Um, the tenant cannot demand that they be there when the landlord enters. This is a common question I get. Can I demand or can I stop the landlord from coming unless I'm there? No. The law doesn't say that. It just says they have to provide proper notice. Now, you can be there. You have a choice. If you want to be there, sure. But you can't stop them just because you are not there. Um, entry must be during <clears throat> normal business hours. You know, there's no clear definition of what that is under the law, but in most cases, everybody generally agrees that it's Monday through Friday, nine to five. Some realtors will argue Saturdays because they do a lot of showing, so that could be arguable. But basically, just no nighttime visits. That's basically what it says. <clears throat> um, the landlord <clears throat> must state the time and date, as well as the purpose of the entry uh, in the notice. So they have to state all these, all this information. And in Richmond, <clears throat> again, it is a just cause to evict a tenant who denies a landlord lawful entry after the tenant has been warned to cease denying lawful access and then continues to do so. So um, before you deny entry, just know um, <clears throat> that it could be a potential just cause to evict if the landlord had a lawful right to enter and the tenant just continues to say, no, you can't come. Okay, next slide. Okay, <clears throat> so this is proper notice when terminating tenancy. So a landlord must give at least 30 days written notice to terminate his tenancy if the tenancy is less than one year. Now, <clears throat> in most cases, this doesn't happen because most, you know, first uh, year of a tenancy is under a fixed term lease. And so, <clears throat> Um, and if that tenant is under just cause, that they really can't give a 30-day notice to just terminate the lease. 
Now, under the same code, a tenant must give a 30-day written notice to vacate or terminate their tenancy and uh, can give notice on any day of the month once the lease is converted to a month-to-month -month lease. Um, so a landlord, but a landlord can require more than 30 days if the tenant is on a fixed-term lease when they're giving notice to vacate. So they can say, well, I want more than 30 days. But they can't say, like, I want 180 days. Most leases, uh, or excuse me, most attorneys agree that 30, 60 days extensions, that kind of thing, on um, this kind of requirement is probably okay. Once you start getting beyond 90 days notice, um, it's probably unenforceable. But <clears throat> that's, I mean, I'm, that's just in my experience. Um, under Civil Code 1946.1, a landlord must give at least 60 days notice, written notice, excuse me, written notice to terminate a tenancy if the tenancy has lasted one year or more. <clears throat> so again, any time there's a tenancy that lasted more than one year, if they wanted to, deter to terminate that tenancy, and again, they'd have to have a just cause if the unit has just cause protections, but they'd have to give at least 60 days notice. Um, and note, any termination notice served by the city of Richmond or served in the city of Richmond must cite one of the permitted just causes for an eviction unless the rental unit is fully exempt from the rent ordinance. So again, they have to have a just cause, but they still have to provide the proper notice under the law, the state law. Okay. <clears throat> so Civil Code 827, giving proper notice for changes in terms of tenancy, including rent increases. So generally changes in terms of tenancy require a minimum 30 day written notice. A notice to increase the rent by 10% during any 12 month uh, period or less requires a 30 day written notice. Um, so again, it's 30 days for any increase up to 10%. But a notice to increase the rent by more than 10% during any 12 month period requires a 90-day written notice of rent increases. And this, by the way, um, just uh, came into effect this year before it was actually 60 days. But as of January 1st, 2020, um, the rent increase beyond 10% requires a 90-day written notice. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So this is the lease breaking law, Civil Code 1951.2. Um, so if a tenant breaks a lease and, you know, they just legitimately break the lease, they are potentially liable for unpaid rent remaining on the lease. And I say potentially because there are requirements uh, on the part of the landlord to charge the tenant that rent. So again, 1951.2 says the landlord can charge for a, more rent even after they leave if, but it's only if, one, the landlord attempts to mitigate unpaid rent damages by making a reasonable effort to re-rent the unit and the unit remains without a sitting tenant. So they actually have to, you know, take some steps to try to get it re-rented, you know, put it on Craigslist or whatever website they want and say, hey, this unit is available for rent. <clears throat> and if they do that, and let's say they do that for, you know, three weeks, right? And then the three weeks they had no sitting tenant, but then after the three weeks, um, they find a new tenant. You, as the tenant who broke the lease, would only be responsible for the three weeks where there was no sitting tenant. After that, the new tenant takes over and they can charge that tenant and they cannot double dip. You can't charge a departed tenant and a sitting tenant for the same unit at the same time. So in other words, if a tenant breaks a lease, the landlord cannot make the tenant pay for the remaining unpaid rent unless the landlord can show that they made a reasonable effort to re-rent and were still unable to find a replacement new tenant. And by the way, it's not, when I say remaining unpaid rent, it's not like if you broke the lease six months into your lease and they start advertising, they can't charge you six months of rent all at once. It's just incremental. It's the same it's monthly. It's just as, so if it goes on for months and they continue, they can continue to charge you. But, you know, in most cases, especially out here in the Bay Area, 
they're going to find a replacement tenant fairly soon. At least that's how it was before the pandemic. Um, once a new tenant occupies the unit, the previous tenant's liability for rent is over. Um, this last point I want to add in and make sure tenants understood. So landlords are also capable of breaking a lease. I want to make sure that's clear. Um, tenants are not the only ones, right? The reason is a lease is a contract. And a contract in its most basic terms is just an exchange of promises. I promise to do something for you if you promise to do something for me. And a landlord-tenant situation is exactly the same, whereas um, <clears throat> the tenant is promising pay the rent, follow the lease. It's kind of it. Um, the landlord is promising to provide the rental unit to you and to also provide the implied warranty of habitability and the implied covenant of quiet enjoyment. So when I say the landlords are capable of breaking the lease, if they don't follow the implied warranty of habitability, there's a potential that you know, they are the ones who actually breach the lease agreement. And therefore the tenant could leave without any further liability. So let's just say for a second that you know, it's an egregious situation where the habitability conditions of the unit are really bad. There's like mold, there's no heat, and there's rats, and it's just bad. <clears throat> and the tenant has children. And they're like, I can't keep my children, you know, they've been notifying the landlord, I can't keep my children in this unit. It's just unsafe, it's unhealthy, and they leave. The landlord can't say, well, you broke your lease. You know, I mean, they, I guess they could say that, but the counter argument to that is the tenant could say, actually, you did. You didn't, you know, remedy these problems. I notified you for months or years or however long, and I just had to go. Right. And so in that situation, the landlord was actually the one who broke the lease, not the tenant. All right. Next slide. Next slide. All right. So these are the final additional important codes that I uh, regularly uh, get questions about. And I think they are important. So the first one is California Civil Code 1717. So first of all, this law basically just says that there's no such thing as a one-way attorney fee provision. So if lease has such a provision, it will be interpreted as applying to all parties in the contract. So let me explain again. So sometimes leases say, in the event that the landlord has to, to go to court to enforce this contract, right? They have to go to court to do an unlawful detainer, or they have to go to court to seek damages for unpaid rent or something like that. And they have to hire an attorney Sometimes it says the, the tenant will be responsible for the landlord's attorney's fee. Well, this code says if such a provision exists, it's actually interpreted as a two-way provision. So even though it still works for the landlord, if the tenant wins in that, um, if they prevail in that lawsuit, the landlord then has to pay for the, for the attorney's fees for the tenant. So it's actually a two-way provision. So there's no such thing as a one-way attorney fee provision. Um, the next one is Civil Code 1942.5. This is an anti-retaliation state law. It says that, <clears throat> I mean, you can read it yourself when you look, it's, it's a bit long, so I don't want to include all of it, but um, uh, it just says that if, you know, any tenant exercises their rights because they like went to like code enforcement or something like that. And then the landlord starts saying, well, what are you doing? And start trying to get them to be evicted or trying to raise their rent or something like that. The tenant can actually use this law and say, well, there's actually, you did this in retaliation for what I did for exercising my rights. There are damages associated with that and I can charge you attorney fees. Now that would all have to be administered through court, but it is an important law. Um, and the last one is Civil Code 1947.3. So this basically says that landlords must allow different forms of payment for rent and deposit besides cash or electronic funds transfer. So they cannot tell you, you only can pay me through cash. You can only pay me through electronic funds. They have to allow at least one other form of payment. There's an exception that if the tenant, um, you know, checks bounced, then they can require like a specific type. But besides that, for most tenants, they have to allow a different form of payment. Okay, that's all. <clears throat> all right, so that's it. Thank you so much for listening um, 
to the presentation, and I believe now we will go into a bit of the uh, Q&A session. Thank you, Palomar. So we're gonna get into the questions. Uh, just to remind everyone, if you do have a question, you can type it into the Q&A <clears throat> box, and we're gonna walk through the questions uh, in the order that they were received. So Monica, if you could just read those questions in that order, and uh, Palomar and I will take, take chances. <clears throat> Sounds good. Okay, so the first question we have is, but for uh, single family homes, landlords can raise the rent to market value whenever they want, right? Um, yeah, so single family homes are unregulated, right? So pursuant to state law, the Casa Hawkins Rental Housing Act, our agency has no authority to say, um, you know, that we can regulate the rents or, you know, accept a petition from a tenant who's in a single family home. So the only thing that protects tenants from uh, in a single family home from getting such a rent increase is if they are on a fixed term lease. So if you're on a fixed term lease, that's a contract for usually a year and that's your rent for the year. Um, but once that contract ends and either one, you become month to month or two, you enter into a new lease agreement then yes, the landlord can increase the rent to whatever level they want. So that is a huge vulnerability when it comes to single family homes. The only protection you have is to continually kind of get those uh, fixed term leases. So at least they don't increase the rent during the lease term. Okay, and the next question we have is, are single family homes fully exempt from the rent ordinance? No, <clears throat> single family homes are exempt from the rent regulation aspect, so we cannot regulate the rent, but the tenants have just cause for eviction protection. So in order to terminate the tenancy for a single family home, the landlord would have to cite at least one of the eight just causes under the rent board. That said though, um, the fact of the matter is that there's a bit of a loophole right? Because the rent is unregulated. If a landlord really wanted to get someone out in a single family home, they could just raise the rent on them until they can't pay it. And then now it's non-payment of rent because they don't, they can't pay the higher amount. Now they have a just cause. So that is a vulnerability when it comes to single family homes, but they do have the just cause for, uh, for eviction protection. Okay, and the next one, um, I could probably answer this one, is the presentation available on PDF format? Um, yes, it is. It's on our website. Uh, I can put the link here to answer your question, and that way you can access the PDF format of this presentation. <clears throat> okay, and the next question, uh, should landlord or tenant be responsible for tenancy registration forms? It's a good question. Um, in most cases, I think it's the landlord's responsibility. Um, that said, I'm not sure. Paige, do we accept registration from tenants? Yes, tenants can register their tenancies as long as they provide a copy of the lease along with the tenancy registration form. But it is, it is the landlord's responsibility and failure to <clears throat> register can be a defense. Uh, it used in court. Um, however, because tenancy registration is a benefit for all, um, it, it's in the tenant's interest that their tenancy is registered so that they can provide yearly notices about what the maximum allowable rent is. And therefore, tenants can register their own tenancies if they provide us with a tenancy <laughs> registration form and a copy of their lease. Right, so the difference is that um, the landlords do not have to provide a copy of the lease but if a tenant registers, they do, right? That's correct. Okay. 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 Uh, let's see the next question here. If I have all the appliances inside the house, is it considered a furnished house? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. If I have all the appliances inside the house, is it considered a furnished house? Possibly. So you're saying when, if you move in, and they provide appliances, um, it depends, right? Like, it, I think most appliances come with an unfurnished unit, like a fridge, you know, that's, that's an unfurnished, but if it comes with like a washer and a dryer, you know, something like that, then it could be considered furnished. If it comes with other things, 
um, you know, air conditioning. I don't know. I mean, it just depends on what exactly they're providing. I mean, in most cases, though, um, furnished really means fully furnished, like it comes with everything. Whether or not, I, and I'm guessing this is in reference to like how much they can charge for a security deposit. Um, that's a good question. I really don't know. Um, it, I think it just depends on the facts and how, what exactly they're trying to provide you. Okay. Next question. Uh, it's a long one. Uh, I have a question regarding serving the notice. Does the landlord have to give tenants the written notice in person, which is the first one, and does the landlord have to notify the tenants several methods? How about email, text, U.S. certified mail, a letter posted on the door? Question mark. Um, so personal service is not necessarily required um, for a rent increase notice. Um, so, um, you know, I often tell landlords they can mail it. So you put in the mail and you also nail it. So you put it on their door. That way there's no question that the tenants receive the notice. The real issue with notice is, did they get it, right? Um, were they properly informed of the rent increase? Um, and so an email may be sufficient, but you know, I would never advise the landlord to just only do it by email or only do it by text. It's just a little bit precarious. Um, the law says proper written notice. Most courts will generally see an email as written especially if there's been, you know, quite a bit of communications back and forth between the landlord and tenant. However, if the tenants never use an email or never seen an email from this landlord and they say, oh, I sent you that email with your notice, I, I don't think that's going to hold up. So, um, you know, again, personal service is not required, but at the same time, they need to do, you know, something to make sure that, that it gets affected. They can do email, text and put it in the mail or something like that, some combination of those, but one single <clears throat> form on its own may be a bit risky and could be challenged. Okay, and our last one that we have here now is due to COVID-19 and CARES Act, can, tenant fi can tenants file tenant rent adjustment petitions because of layoffs or other financial situations? Can you file a petition for a layoff? Um, well, there are petitions are based on, you know, challenging a rent increase, for example, or even right now, do, during the pandemic and the current Richmond order, um, if a tenant says, you know, I'm suffering financial harm and the landlord continues to try to charge them rent, they could file a petition. Um, but, you know, you can't reduce your rent simply for the fact that you lost your job. Um, the, there has to be some type of reason related to the ordinance or right now the order as far as the pandemic is going um, in order to you know, file some type of petition. Um, you know, let's just say the pandemic wasn't going on and you lost your, you know, your job or your hours were reduced, um, but the rent is still due. Right, so you don't get to file a petition simply because your financial circumstances have changed. Um, if you agree to pay a certain amount of rent in terms of the contract, then you're responsible for that. Um, but if there are, like I said earlier in the in the presentation, um, issues of habitability, or overcharges, or reduction in space, services, or just you know, uh, have you know, like I said, all the co covenant of quiet enjoyment, those are all petitionable issues. And I don't know, Paige, if you wanted to add anything to that. <clears throat> no, Palomar, I think, I think you answered the question adequately. At, at this time, there's no petition available due to COVID. Um, and, and one of the reasons for that is because the emergency order was passed by the city council. It was not passed by the rent board. And so um, we do as much as we can to inform the community <clears throat> about the current emergency order and the protections that it provides, but we are not the agency to enforce it. Okay. Uh, this question is, I've had an annual lease for five plus years on a single family home. That is the sole rental property owned by my landlord. This week, after many repeated citations by the Richmond Rent Inspection Program, they finally had severe rodent 
remediation proofing done, including replacement of attic insulation that had been destroyed? Can they pass on any or all of the costs of that mandated, mandated repair to me in the form of rent increase? Uh, and this is a single family home, is that what I heard correctly? Yes. Yeah, um, unfortunately, yes, because I mean, they, they may not say that, right? They may not say, oh, well, we have to do all this work, so we're gonna charge you for that. They'll just increase the rent, you know, there's, it's unregulated. So at the expiration of your current lease, they may just be like, well, we had some expenses last year, so we're gonna raise the rent. And unfortunately, there's nothing to do about that because single family homes are just unregulated. There's nothing to really challenge. Now, <clears throat> that said, I think in theory, you could challenge it in court by saying it's an unreasonable rent increase, right? It's well beyond what your expenses were, or let's just say they, you know, there was an earlier question about raising a single family home's rent to market. If they raise it to an, a quote unquote market level that is completely out of whack, like $15,000 a month or something crazy, then I think you would have ability to challenge it. But it's a pretty high level, like high bar. Um, most judges and courts would probably be okay with extremely high rent increases for a single family home. It's just that when it gets to a level, it just seems ridiculous that they may step in. But in most cases, at least in my experience, the courts just, they just say, yeah, that's fine. And there's no, you know, the state law says there's just no regulation. So it's a pretty uphill battle to challenge a substantial rent increase on a single family home in any circumstance. Okay. <clears throat> Our next question is specifically which state regulations, if any, cover allowable rent increases on single family homes for yearly lease? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Sure. <clears throat> Specifically, which state regulations, if any, cover allowable rent increases on single family homes for a yearly lease? So again, none. Um, the only thing is proper notice. So they can increase the rent without any limits so long as proper written notice is provided to the tenant. And again, under state law, it's either going to be 30 days if the increase is up to 10%, but if it's anything beyond 10%, then it's 90 days. But that's it. There's no real other rules, regulations, limits, nothing. You just, there, there just isn't. Casa Hawkins was an extremely broad law, and they said, very matter-of-factly, you cannot regulate the rents on these kinds of units, period. You can't do it. And that's even true right now with the current order, right? Like the current order, as I said in the beginning, there's a <clears throat> moratorium on rent increases for residential properties. But there's an exception to that for single family homes because of that same state law and condos too, so. Alamar, the, the only thing I would add to that is um, the provisions of AB 1482, which oh, may yeah. impact rent increases. <clears throat> for single family homes if they're owned by corporations or LLCs. So I wasn't sure if you wanted to expand any on that. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. So yeah, that's correct. Um, there is the new state law, which was uh, Assembly Bill 1482. It has now created three separate civil statutes. Um, there is a particular uh, situation where single family homes would be regulated um, but that's only if the single family home is owned by like a real estate investment company, a trust where most of the trustees are a corporation. Um, so there's very, basically if it's, if it's owned by just regular people, it's not going to be regulated. But if it's owned by some type of organization, like a, a trust or some type of other, you know, similar, uh, I forget exactly what the, I'd have to look at the law itself. Um, then yes, there could be some type of rent regulation for a single family home. Um, and that is all outlined in um, those civil codes. I think it's 1947.12. That's the new civil code regarding um, the state uh, anti-gouging law, which does not apply to most of the properties in Richmond because our local jurisdiction's ordinance is going to rule before the state law. 
And if there are questions about AB 1482, I would encourage individuals to go to our workshop page. We did a workshop in January <laughs> about the state anti-gouging law. And so you can review those materials and then contact us if you have any questions. But for specific citations and very detailed information about that state law, you can see our presentation at richmondrent.org slash workshops. We also have a fact sheet on AB 1482 available on the website as well. Okay, great. My uh, next question is, if my landlord gives the notification for a rent increase, do I have to reply yes or no? If I don't reply, does it mean I accept the rent increase? So there's no reply required for any type of rent increase notice because if the landlord has a lawful right to increase the rent to that amount, then it's just a notice, that's it. There's no reply required because it's not required by law. Um, you're, the landlord is simply giving you notice saying, hey, 30 days or 90 days from now, uh, your rent will start to be this amount on this date. That's it. There's no, you know, again, assuming that the, the the notice is legal and properly provided and the rent increase is legal, then no, no reply is required. Okay, and this question is referring back to the furnished house question. Mm -hmm. um, if they provide a washer, dryer, fridge, and dishwasher, so is it considered a furnished <clears throat> house? And then, so I can charge more for deposit. Again, I don't know. Uh, that's a difficult question to answer because I really don't. The, that, the, the law does not specify what that means, uh, furnished or unfurnished. Like I said, in most cases, people provide fridges, uh, dishwashers at least. Um, and so I would say that's not going to be a furnished unit. The fact that you provide a washer, a dryer, maybe. Um, but, you know, again, I don't know if if it seems to you that it's furnished, then you can attempt to, but I can't tell you whether or not that that would be legally feasible or enforceable. I mean, I just, I'm just trying to imagine a unit that I look at and it's empty besides having a fridge, a dishwasher and a washer and dryer. Would I think that was furnished personally? Probably not, but I don't know. I mean, the law is kind of unclear on that level because it just doesn't define what furnished or unfurnished is. Um, so if you're considering that, you may want to talk to an attorney to see, you know, what they think um, to see what's the best course of action for you. Okay, next question. During the COVID-19, how many months can landlords evict tenants if tenants keep, sorry, let me rephrase. During the COVID-19, how many months can the landlord evict tenants if the tenant keeps rent unpaid for more than three months? Is it required to show your income paperwork? So the order does not require any type of documentation or paperwork. So the tenants merely need to provide the notice. That's it. The order also says that um, tenants have up to 12 months to pay back any of the, un of the unpaid rent that was covered during the order. So if your tenant has been giving uh, notice every month, and you know, right now the order is still in existence and it goes to July 15th and maybe further extended, we don't know. Um, they are gonna have 12 months after this order, that order is lifted to pay back those months of rent. So a landlord cannot take any action based on those months of rent if the tenant has provided that notice saying, hey, I'm suffering financial harm. So say for example, the tenant didn't pay for you know, April and May, right? But then they start paying rent after that. That means whenever this order ends, they're gonna have 12 months, one year to pay back April and May rent. Now, if they don't pay the rent, you know, let's say the order ex expires on July 15th and it just ends. That means August rent is due. And if they don't pay August rent, then the landlord could try to evict for August rent, but they cannot try to evict for the April May rent that was covered under the order. I hope that answers the question. Okay, next question is my lease will end at the end of a month. I want to sign a two year lease. Can my landlord reject my request? 
so you want to so the lease is about to end i'm assuming it was a one-year lease and then you want to get aid to a two-year lease um i i think that's what i heard correctly um yes, that's the question yes yeah. okay um <clears throat> well a contract is or excuse me a lease is a contract and so you you know you can ask your landlord if that's possible and they can agree right they can sign you up for two years they can sign up for 10 years if they want um, but that's up to them and you. I mean, it's a two-party contract, so each party has to agree. If they say no, well, that's kind of it. You know, they don't have to enter into a two-year if they do not want to. But if you say, yeah, you know, that, you know, if maybe you should provide a reason and that, you know, I, I don't know what type of property this is, but let's say it's a single-family home, for example, and you negotiate a, a certain amount of rent then yeah they could be open to that but do they have to no but just to clarify if they don't decide to renew the lease the tenant can still live there oh yes of course it's not like your tenancy has ended right um, mere expiration of a lease is not a just cause to evict you can't the tenant can't be evicted for not signing a new lease um, and they can't be evicted for just the lease just expiring and becoming a month-to-month -month tenant. If it has just cause protection, then the landlord has to cite one of the just causes. And there's no just cause that says mere expiration of a lease is a just cause to evict. And there's no just cause that says uh, failure to sign a new lease is a just cause to evict. So, you know, it, it's not the end of the tenancy simply because of this uh, predicament. So once the lease is up, then it will roll over to a month-to-month -month tenancy. The same term Correct. of the lease apply, but Correct. the rent could be increased depending on what type of unit it is. Also correct, right. So the rules of the lease will still be in play. So for example, if your lease says no dogs and your lease ends, it's not like you can go out and get a big dog. The rules are still there. It's just the term, the initial term of that lease is over. Um, but everything else about you having to pay rent and the rules of the leasing, that's all still there. And you automatically, as Paige said, um, once a lease expires, you automatically, by law, become a month-to-month -month tenant unless you, you, know, a, you and the landlord uh, re-sign a new fixed-term lease. Okay. Next question is, for single-family homes, do landlords need to give a written notice for a less than 10% rent increase? Yes. So per uh, civil code 827, any increase up to 10% requires at least 30 days written notice. You have to, no matter what, every rent increase in California, you, doesn't matter where you are, you must provide proper written notice and that's either 30 or 90 days. Okay. Uh, next question is, why are single family homes so unregulated? It's hmm, a good question. Um, I'm not sure if you heard me uh, earlier speaking about the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act. So this is a key landmark law that was passed in 1996 and came into effect in 1997. Um, the reality is that since the 1980s, the Bay Area had rent control in various jurisdictions, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, all passed and like 79, 81, 82, that kind of stuff. Um, so rent control was, you know, long time standing. Um, then uh, at some point, you know, landlords started to not like that because like I said before, uh, before this rent control was continuous. So if I left a rent control department, I vacated, the next tenant, no matter who they were, they got my rental rate no matter what, even if it was super low. So the landlord could never like reset to market. Then that all changed in 1996. And the law, the, this law, the, it's called Costa Hawkins because those are the two legislators, the names of the two legislators who created it, um, said no, for any rent control jurisdiction, if there's a new tenancy, you can reset the rent. Not only did they say that, but they said, well, also, Single family homes are, are any property that is separate and alienable on title, meaning a condominium, for example, those rents just cannot be regulated. You just can't do it. Um, and this is a huge law that completely changed the kind of status of rent control in general 
And so, um, you know, it, it, it was just a major change and, and, you know, that's how it is that the, the law just said single family home, you just have no rent re regulation, no matter what. Well, now there's the state law, but again, those are specific requirements. Okay. Um, next question is how many times can a landlord increase the rent in a single family home per year? Uh, again, there's no limit as long as they provide proper written notice and the, the, you know, the tenant isn't on a fixed term lease. There is no limit. There's no limit of how many or how much, right? I mean, I guess there is a limit because since you have to provide proper written notice, you can only provide so many per year, but uh, at the same time, there really technically there is no limit. <clears throat> okay. And what is the difference between the AGA percentage and a possible rent increase of 10% or more? So the AGA is never that high. Um, last year was 3.5%. This year it's 2.9%. Um, so a 10% rent increase is pretty high. Um, the fact of the matter is that, you know, as I said before, landlords can in general uh, bank AGAs and kind of catch up on AGAs, but but we have a regulation. It's at the bottom there. It says Regulation 602 um, that says that there's a limit of five percent plus the current year's AGA. So so if you take last year's AGA, 3.5 percent, you add five percent, that's 8.5 percent. That's the maximum that this year that they could uh, increase it by. Um, so the 10% is even higher than that. So they can't do that for a fully rent controlled unit. Um, and you know, it, it just, it just won't happen unless they, you know, file some type of petition and somehow get that much. Okay. And uh, next question is if the tenant has, if the tenant has owed two months rent and still claims there's no income after July 15th, the landlord can start an eviction process? <clears throat> well, remember that it depends on if the eviction is based on the rent that was covered under the order, because the order says tenants have 12 months to pay back that rent. So after July 15th, if you're saying they don't, they haven't paid the, that rent that was covered, no, you can't evict for that. They have 12 months, you have to wait. Um, but as I said before, if it's, for example, August, rent, let's just say the order expires July 15th and the order, or excuse me, and then the tenant doesn't pay August rent, then yes, they, you can attempt to evict for that month's rent, but you just have to wait the 12 months for any unpaid rent that was covered under the order. Okay, and next question is, can landlords raise the rent on a single family home during the term of an annual lease or only upon renewal of the lease? Um, in most cases, you can only do it upon the renewal. Um, you know, I have seen leases where it says that landlord can increase the rent by this amount, you know, inflation, something like that. I think that's possible. Um, that said, it's incredibly rare. And I think even a, a tenant in a single family home could uh, challenge it and say, that's not what I agreed to, I guess. But um, in most cases, no, if it's a fixed term lease, that's it. That, that's the term that you and the landlord agreed to and the rent to be paid every month. So, and that's for the end, the full term. So what, but once that term, you know, is about to end, they can say, well, we're going to have you on another lease, uh, but we're increasing the rent to, you know, whatever. And then they, you know, as long as they provide that notice, then they could increase the rent to whatever level they want. Okay, next question is, what if the landlord can't finish all repairs in 21 days after tenants move out because, the available, because of the availability of the contractor? Can a landlord charge the repairs amount based on the one quote? That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I think there is some part of California Civil Code 1950.5, which says that, that there, there's projected work um, that they can charge for that. But um, I think 
yeah, I, I guess it's possible. And plus, you know, I think that if there is delays or something, especially right now with um, COVID, obviously everything is delayed and, you know, getting people to come into a home is like, just takes longer, it's more difficult right now. So in that situation, you know, it's probably just best idea to con stay in contact with the tenant and say, hey, you know, I know the 21 days is coming or it just passed, but you know, this has been happening. I'm gonna return your deposit because as soon as possible, but you know, I need to get these workers, you know, whatever. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I don't know, a, a tenant could in theory challenge it because the law says 21 days. So, you know, there's no prohibition on a tenant saying, well, I don't care what you say, I'm just gonna go file my claim. And they could file it. Um, but, you know, they're not going to get a hearing on that matter for, you know, well, at least before the pandemic, it was at least like two or three months before you get a hearing. Um, now it's probably much longer. So I don't know. Um, you know, but it, it's difficult to say right now. But at the same time, I think, um, you know, keeping in communication with the tenant can potentially avoid any type of, you know, lawsuit or litigation. Okay, that's the last question we have. Uh, we have five more minutes for Q&A, so we can so wait to see if more have questions. Okay, so we have one that a few popped up. <laughs> Okay, okay, so let's see what this one says. And by the way, if we run out of time, you still have questions, you can always contact us, email us or give us a call um, and we will, you know, uh, promptly uh, call you back or email you back. Okay, <clears throat> so the question is, what is the prohibiting rent increases and or evictions for residential and commercial tenants? I'm sorry, you say that one more time, Monica? Uh, the question is, what is the prohibiting rent increases and or eviction for residential and commercial tenants? So um, there's no uh, prohib prohibition right now in Richmond due to the current order on rent increases for a commercial tenancy. So it's only for residential, that's one. Um, and two, um, in terms of evictions, um, the order says that a landlord cannot uh, terminate a tenancy based on non-payment of rent um, if the tenant has claimed and notified the landlord of some type of financial hardship due to COVID-19. The, the landlords are also prohibited from um, terminating a tenancy based on any no-fault eviction, such as an owner move-in or an Ellis Act eviction um, or just straight terming the tenancy. Um, but, uh, you know, the order doesn't say anything about other types of eviction. So for example, nuisance, breach of lease, that kind of thing. Those actually are not prohibited. That said though, by the order, that said though, um, there are, if, if a landlord is considering an eviction right now for say breach of lease, um, all I can say is good luck because the courts have changed the rule. Well, there's several levels of rule changes in terms of evictions that have happened. Um, and this is again, this is un, this is not the order. This is the, um, this is several levels of government. One is the, um, the governor's office. So back in March, um, the governor, um, passed a uh, executive order that changed the normal response times for unlawful detainers from five days, it used to be five days to 60 days. So six zero, so that's one. Also the Contra Costa County Courts as well as the Judicial Council of California who are the governing body for all California courts said, um, even if you file a land, if a landlord files on the law of the detainer, the courts are not going to send summons, which is the uh, documents to inform someone that they are being sued or evicted. Um, they're not going to issue summons unless the eviction is based on a public health and safety issue. Um, so that could be, you know, for example, like a tenant 
fighting with other tenants or tenants in the same unit having a domestic violence issue, something like that. Um, and this, these rules are in effect uh, for 90 days after the governor lifts these executive orders. So right now, just unlawful detainers are extremely difficult. And if you are, if you are a landlord and you're considering one, um, it's just highly recommended that you talk to an attorney right now because the because of all these rule changes, because of the limited capacity of the courts, um, it's just extremely difficult. And just logistically, logistically speaking, I just you know I I used to do these myself, but right now I have no idea how these cases are being run. So it's a good step to do your due diligence um, if you're considering pursuing some type of, of eviction. With and keeping in mind that you know in most cases, especially for non-payment of rent, you just can't do anything about it right now. Okay, uh, next question. Um, I think they might have missed the overview of the AB 1482. Um, they're asking, what is AB 1482? So AB 1482 was a state law. Um, it's actually called an anti-gouging law. Um, and it establishes some um, kind, of, kind of rent regulation and just cause protections for properties in California. Um, that said though, um, properties that already have just cause ordinances um, prior to September of 2019, those ordinances will govern. So for example, Richmond's law has been around since uh, the end of 2016. And so our just cause uh, ordinance rules will govern. Um, our rent control um, aspect will also govern um but you know but it's really because you know one there's you know we've been in existence we're also a little bit more restrictive and the fact of the matter is that in order to be under the rent regulation aspect of um the state law there has to be some specific requirements um like like we me and Paige talked about earlier if it's a single family home for example it has to be owned by like a uh, an investment, a real estate investment trust or some type of corporation or something like that. Um, but that's the law. Um, it, it's codified now in three separate civil codes. Um, the two most important ones are 1947.12 and 1946.2. And both of, or all of these laws and as well as a fact sheet are um, available uh, on our website. Um, or not the law itself. The law itself, you can just kind of look it up on the um, on the web. But um, we have a fact sheet as well as a uh, workshop presentation available for it on our website. Great. Um, and just for time, uh, we have three minutes, um, and we have a few questions here, so we'll hopefully get through them. But if not, like Palomar said, you can refer to the um, slide on your screen um, by emailing us or giving us a call. Um, next question is, what agency should tenants of single-family homes on fixed-term lease contact for habita habitability issues that landlords aren't fixing? Hmm. <clears throat> so um, habitability issues are, you know, a very common concern. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, even though your rent is not regulated by us, um, you can still contact us to, one, ask about, you know, the laws and your rights regarding your specific situation. Um, you can also contact us to potentially get um, an inspection done from the city. Um, now, right now, obviously during the pandemic, that's a bit uh, maybe delayed or just different. I'm not sure. Um, I have sent a few couple referrals, I think, since this whole pandemic thing started. And I think they are doing them, but it's taking longer and it's just, they have to be more cautious, obviously. Um, but you can still contact us and the laws uh, are still the same for you as they are for fully rent control tenants, meaning that you still have the implied warranty of habitability, the implied covenant of quiet enjoyment, and civil code 1941.1, health and safety code 17920.3. They all apply to all properties in California period. And so in terms of agencies though, we can still be a resource. It's just that we can't give you a rent decrease uh, based on those issues. But we could provide a referral to the building official. Correct. Inspection. Yep. Okay. Uh, we have 
this question. How long does this COVID-19 eviction moratorium last? <laughs> um, so right now, the, the current order moratorium is uh, set to expire on July 15th, but uh, it may be extended again by the city council. Um, it's up to them whether or not they want to do it. And, um, you know, I don't know what they're going to decide, but the fact of the matter is that there's been a spike in cases, both in California and in Contra Costa County specifically. So, you know, I don't know, uh, but my guess is it'll probably get extended again. If and by how much, I don't know. Um, but right now, as it stands, it's set to expire July 15th. Okay. And uh, this might be a quick answer here. Uh, so this person's asking if they have to provide a notice of exemption um, if they do not fall under rent control. Paige, you wanna <laughs> take that one? So um, if you're exempt from the rent ordinance because you fall under the <clears throat> exempt category, you're not required to notice us. If you have questions about whether or not you're covered under the ordinance, uh, we encourage you to contact us. And if there's a dispute between a landlord and tenant about whether a notice uh, or whether a unit is covered under the ordinance or not, you can file a request for an administrative determination. So to do that, I would, I would recommend that you contact our office to speak with a housing counselor. But in general, there's no requirement in the ordinance that you need to let tenants know that their unit is exempt. Okay, uh, we have one question, and uh, so I don't know if we have time to answer. Yeah, we can do this. this will be the last one, though. <clears throat> okay, yeah, this is the last question. Uh, do tenants have to notify landlords of criminal or drug activities in their neighborhoods? If they do, what should landlords do? It's a good question. Um, you don't have to, obviously. It's up to you, but you can, and if it's affecting you know your tenancy and you're concerned and potentially dangerous sure you probably should and if you want the landlord to do something about it you kind of have to right because they're not going to necessarily know until you let them know and, and plus um you know changes in like security for example are not always required by a landlord unless they know there's something that's happening so there have been cases like this before where um, like a landlord uh, received information from a tenant about um, people breaking in or something like that. Uh, and the landlord didn't do anything. <clears throat> and then those people came back and they continued to break in. And those tenants then sued the landlord uh, for like all kinds of damages and they won. Um, so there is a potential liability um, because if the landlord knows that there's criminal activity, um, then they, it's not like it's automatic that they have to like put lights and cameras and this and that. But if it's, you know, verified through multiple people and it's gone on, they get continue to receive like documented notices from tenants saying, hey, this is a problem and they just don't do anything about it, then they could be held liable for it. So um, yeah, if there's criminal activity and you want something to be done about it, the first step, and this is similar to habitability too, the, the first and major main step is always to inform the landlord and document the fact that you did inform them. Because sometimes landlords, you know, they say, I didn't, what are you talking about? And, you know, and that's why I say written notice, like always provide a written documentation <clears throat> excuse me, if you call your landlord, it's very easy to say, I don't, what are you talking about? What phone call? I, I, oh, we talked, you know, three months ago. I don't remember that. But if you have an email, right, there's a dated timestamp document that you let the landlord know or a text even um, about this issue. And so they can never say, oh, I never got that, right? So yes, it's, it's helpful to inform the, the landlord or management company of any of these particular types of issues. So with that, I think that concludes this morning's presentation. I wanna thank everyone for joining us. And if you have any further questions or you didn't get a question answered that you had this morning,
please contact us at rent at ci.richmond.ca.us or you can give us a call at 510-234-RENT. And this presentation is available on our website at richmondrent.org on the workshops page. Thanks everyone. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much for coming.